Many of you will have seen the videos from Bali of people swimming through clouds of plastic in what should be pristine beaches. You may have heard about research being done on Lord Howe Island off the Australian coast, which has found that 100% of seabird chicks have plastic in their stomachs. You may also have seen or heard of the ABC's awesome War on Waste series. Each of these highlights the growing issue that plastic is becoming in our world. I hope that churches will take these opportunities to talk about waste and to connect with their communities around waste issues. Personally, I've been thinking about these things a lot. Feeling guilty every time I put something in the bin and I'm even trying to be more vigilant about taking my keep cup with me everywhere. I've started saving soft plastics to go in the special soft plastic recycling bins at the supermarket. And I've been trying to implement some of the ideas provided in the zero waste Facebook groups that I'm part of. I've also been reflecting on how I seem to be particularly wasteful when I'm tired, stressed or in a hurry. I have a growing sense that being green is all about lifestyle, about hundreds of tiny daily decisions all rolled together. When we talk about environmentalism or caring for creation in public discourse, there is a sense in which we tend to see it as a few discrete actions. We want everyone to do the right thing. So we try to make things easy for them, try to set it out as just a few quick steps. And there are many steps that we can take that are quick and easy and make an important difference. But when you reflect on going deeper, on making real and challenging commitments, like developing a zero waste lifestyle, it quickly becomes obvious that these kinds of easy changes barely scratch the surface of what is needed. Of course, companies and governments want us to believe that being green is about basically living exactly the same way, but just adding in buying a few eco products occasionally, thus creating a new market that they can exploit. It's safe and easy and it makes them money. It fits within our current lifestyles, our consumerist culture and the framework of capitalism. And it's so easy to just go along. So easy to give in to the temptation to let them reassure us, to let ourselves believe that our share can be achieved quickly and easily, and then we can move on to other things. But I think deep down, we know that we are in denial. When we hear about the projected impacts of climate change and see the destruction of rainforests, the bleaching of coral reefs, and the rapid extinction of species around the world, we know that this can't be a problem that is so easily solved. We sense that there must be much bigger changes needed. After all, when scientists start talking about this as the time of the Anthropocene, a time when the impact of humanity upon the world has become so great that we might deserve to have a geological epoch named after us, you know that this is a big deal. We are creating the sixth great extinction, us, one single species in our destructiveness are wiping out so many other creatures that the earth has not seen such extinction in millions of years. We are now a force as significant as a meteor impact or the end of an ice age. Think about that for a moment, the enormity of it. As a Christian, reflecting on such death and destruction sends me looking for hope looking for resurrection and new life, looking for what the wisdom the gospel and the scriptures have to offer us in this situation. What does God think about waste? Well, the Bible doesn't include many passages specifically focused on waste in the reducing our rubbish sense, probably because it seemed like less of an issue in a less populated world. There is a strong sense throughout scripture that God is a pretty frugal being and wants us to be too. After all, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he instructed his disciples to gather up all of the leftover fragments so that nothing may be lost. John 6 verse 12. 
Likewise, God's prophets repeatedly condemned those who lived in greed and abundance and offered no aid to the poor and needy. For example, Ezekiel 16 verse 49. In the laws handed down to the Israelites, God instructed them to leave the edges of their fields when harvesting crops so that the poor and the wild animals might also have food. These laws also instruct the Israelites not to cut down the trees when they are attacking a city, since the war is not against the trees. God didn't want wasteful destruction to be part of his chosen people's behaviour. Our Uniting Church Basis of Union says, There is no gift without its corresponding service. While the Basis' authors spoke of spiritual gifts, I believe there is a word here for us also. Our purchases are gifts from God, but with each gift comes a corresponding service, a responsibility to recognise the resources that go into producing each and everything that we use. Not just the big things, but also the clothes, coffee cups and food that we use and consume every day. Our purchases may pass through our lives quickly, but each item takes many contributions to make. God's water, God's fertile land and resources, and the work of God's people. And while our greed is creating mountains of waste, millions around the world go without. So we have a responsibility to reduce, to reuse, to recycle, to make sure that we are responsible for the gifts that we have. Then there is creation itself the breathtaking abundance of amazing creatures that have evolved into existence on Earth at this time. Some have joked that given the abundance of beetle species on this Earth, God must be particularly fond of them. Perhaps this is a wasteful creativity on God's part. Surely one or two species of beetles should have been enough for God? Even ten? Why do we need something like 400,000 species? That's about 30% of all the animals that we know of. Perhaps you might say that we don't. Certainly lots of people like to argue to me that we don't need mosquitoes, that perhaps God shouldn't have made them or doesn't have an essential purpose for them so we can just wipe them out. But one of the things that I love about science is that the more we learn, the more we realise how fragile, how intricate, how inconceivably entangled each and every part of creation is. For example, did you know that wolves can change the path and flow of a river? Have you heard this story? In the 1920s, wolves disappeared from Yellowstone National Park. When they left, the entire ecosystem changed. Elk herds in the park increased in numbers and happily ate all of the aspens, willows and cottonwoods that lined the streams. Vegetation declined and all the animals that depended on the trees left. The resulting erosion changed the path of the river. 70 years later, wolves were reintroduced and the elk's peace ended. The wolf packs kept the herds on the move, browsing diminished and the trees sprang back. The roots of the cottonwoods and willows stabilised the stream banks again and slowed the flow of water. This made space for animals like beavers to return. They now had the materials they needed to construct their lodges and raise their families, damming entire sections of the river and altering its flow again. The animals that depended on the riparian meadows also returned and the river returned to its normal path and flow. So it turns out wolves are essential to healthy rivers. Who saw that coming? Or how could we have known that commercial whaling, overfishing and the fur trade in the Pacific Ocean by robbing orcas or killer whales of their usual food sources would cause them to start eating sea otters instead? So then there weren't enough sea otters to control the sea urchins who eat all of the kelp, leading to severe thinning of the local kelp forests, such that they can no longer support fish breeding, which has led to a reduction in fish prey for the vast array of animals that depend on the fish, including us. Such small, simple changes with such big consequences. In the delicate balance of nature, there is no waste. Everything is recycled, reused, flowing through complex webs in the great circle of life. When God placed us in the garden with all of this abundance, it was as wise stewards, not as wasteful and despotic overlords. 
even if we don't always live up to that calling. So I'm coming to a new understanding of what it means for us to be truly faithful disciples of Jesus within our time. I think we need to widen our scope of compassion and thinking, as the Holy Spirit so often challenges us to do. As Jesus says in Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Likewise, we have heard that it was said to be wise stewards and to care for creation. But I say that a central focus of our whole lifestyle should be sustainability. Every Christian should be on a journey to reduce their waste, their energy use and their impact on God's creation. This is not an optional extra, not something to talk about just occasionally, but something that should be part of our DNA as Christians, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I think it's easy for us as Christians to get distracted from what's most important about the way we live. Instead of changing ourselves, sometimes we end up judging others and trying to convince ourselves that we're better than them over small things. But Christ Jesus always calls us back to love, back to what really matters. Our lives are a gift from God, and as Christians, we should be expected to appreciate the value of and the responsibilities that come with that gift. So what if instead of Jesus bumper stickers on our cars, we proclaimed our faith to others by saving water, by traveling on public transport even when it's inconvenient, by helping with conservation projects for endangered species, and working continually to reduce our waste as much as possible? What if our uniforms as Christians became overalls, hiking boots, and gardening gloves? If our bookstores became full of eco-literature and eco-products, and we shared skills, books, tools, and fruit and veg from our gardens with our churches each week? What if we could look at the most dedicated environmentalists in the world and know that they must be Christians, that their love for God must be what inspires them to such faithfulness, such discipleship? Does your heart begin to beat with the same light of hope, the same sense of calling that mine does? Let us rise to God's challenge. Let us be disciples of the good news for all creation, in all nations, times and places.